What's happening, ladies and gentlemen? Austin here with Block Bites, and we have got one hell of a show for you today. So Core PCE coming in a little bit hot out there, guys. The macro picture, it's teetering on the edge. Let's just call it that. Coinbase came out and launched uh, or is launching their very own KYC, maybe permissioned, layer two, uh, built on the Optimism substack with the potential to bring millions and millions of people into DeFi. Probably, and I would say, one of the most pivotal moves we've seen this year in crypto. SBF is facing 115 years. And China, is China getting friendly with crypto? This is what we all want to know. And that's what we're going to talk about on today's show. Let's get after it. Emmett, take us in. here we're here we are live with mr crypto clay mark yep. jeffrey corval's at the vatican or something <laughs> Dude, it's trinity library <laughs> and bro you look like you're straight out of the sopranos can i just tell you there you look like you look like you just ate a gabagool sandwich and uh may he rest in peace gabagool God, and I wish. uh <laughs> How is everybody? Mark, you you were not with us last week because you were doing some really cool shit over there in uh, Tinseltown. What, 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 what's been going on? Yeah, so I, um, I did a presentation on Web3 for something called the LA CEOs group. And it's, uh, it's, you know, it's usually a meeting of about 70 or 80 Los Angeles venture invested tech CEOs uh, put on by a guy named Mark Lande. Uh, this, this time around, it took place at Upfront Ventures. Uh, here in LA, which is one of the big VCs here locally. And, um, you know, basically, uh, you know, these people don't live in our world and they're very curious about it. And all they know is what they read in the news, right? So after the, pre it was, the presentation was pretty well received and a lot of people were, the reaction was kind of like, wow, I didn't know uh, it was like this. All I read is a bunch of bad news in the Wall Street Journal. So it was really refreshing and really surprising to hear you describe how DeFi works and it sounds really cool, right? So that was kind of the vibe. That's man, cool, the man. light, light in the darkness. That's yeah. we should we should change your name. We should give you like a nickname around that. That's <laughs> awesome. Clay, how you doing, man? I so if for anyone that doesn't watch our daily show, you were sharing the other day a little mishap that happened when you were giving blood. You want to uh tell <laughs> Yeah, I uh, I went face first into the uh the chair that you know, like the, the chairs <laughs> that they take you in or that come down. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm I'm uh if, if, if there's going to be a doctor in the family, it's not me. Let's put it that way. So I also like, had in eight in like 18 hours. So I, I don't know. I don't know whether it was like pure panic or the amount of blood that they took, but whatever it was, face first into this chair. I guess I looked at the lady and went, "I don't feel so well," and literally went face down, came up, and I was like covered in sweat, ghost white. It was, uh, dude. It was, it was, it was rough, man. Dude, yeah. you okay though? I'm good. I'm good. But yeah, I don't know so, what that was about. Over the last few weeks, <laughs> maybe four weeks, poor Clay has had a lot of doctor's visits, man. man. You had that salivary thing. Yep. You had a, a little checkup. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't need to go too far down the road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then the poor guy fell out of a chair giving blood. It's been yeah. a, it's been a rough week. It's been a rough week for me, man. My my poor wife's in the hospital. And, and you know, honestly, to her credit, I've got to tell you, she was like, yo, go do your show. You need some normalcy because she knows how like happy this makes me to do. I'm going to be heading back to the hospital afterwards. She's doing okay. The baby's okay. Everyone's stable. But it was definitely a very, very scary week. And uh, and it's kind of a scary day in the markets, I think, for a lot of people that weren't expecting this. So let's, let's have a discussion real quick. So the macro outlook is very up in the air right now. We got PCE data, personal uh, core Exp personal consumption expenditures. Corval, I am going to kick over to you to explain this shit. Um, yeah. But it came in hot. And so from what I understand, this is this is very similar to CPI. It's a reflection of inflation, but it is, it's kind of the preferred data metric of like Yellen, of uh, JPOW and, and some of the different people around the Fed. So the year over year uh, core PCE came in at 4.7 with an expectation of, I believe 4.3. Am I reading this correctly? Yeah, uh, yeah, four point three, uh, and then we had the uh, the headline or the the regular PCE come in at five point four with an expectation of four point nine, and so <clears throat> I was I was reading a Twitter post earlier today 
uh, from a guy that was kind of explaining why does CPI get all the love and PCE really doesn't get all the love. And, and I think it has a lot to do with, from what he explained, that CPI generally comes out earlier in the month. Uh, and so it's the front runner. And so it's the one that the markets react the heaviest to because it, you know, it's coming out before the Fed meetings are happening. And by the way, for anyone asking, unfortunately, Nick couldn't be here today. He had uh, some prior engagements. So uh, you get the four of us today. But Corval, let's start with you, man. Tell me, tell me, what is, what is core PCE? Is this something that like we should be uh, super nervous about? Give me the deets. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't be uh, super nervous about it. I mean, not much you could do about it. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's a uh, PCE measures uh, is a measure of inflation that uses a different method of calculation than CPI. And the Fed prefers it because it's a generally considered to be a bit more accurate. And uh, it's not supposed to fluctuate as much uh, like CPI. So CPI, you know, they get those numbers by sending out household surveys and it'll be like, what of the, how much did you pay for each of these expenditures this week? And it'll list like a bunch of goods. Um, but PCE, they gather the data directly from, uh, I'm not sure if it was retail, like producers, like manufacturers, like how many units did you sell of the, all these different products? Mm. And it's not a specified list. So it allows them to track like, so say the CPI for bread, like bread is in the basket of goods, goes up really high. Um, the average person, instead of paying a higher price, price for bed, bread, will probably just substitute it with something else. PCE will capture that change in expenditure to see like your household is still spending money um, regardless of the bread price going up. It might still be going up. So yeah, it's uh, and it is what the Fed prefers. Uh, they said it time and time again. They don't necessarily really care too much about CPI. Uh, they care way more about PCE. And to see it go up, uh, it just means you know, higher interest rates longer, whether they'll get more aggressive in the rate hikes, who knows? They've already said their target was, I believe, um, 4.25 or something like that. that well, wrong. this is interesting. So, I mean, we've seen a fairly consistent drop in, you know, the CPI numbers and the PCE mm -hmm. numbers over the past few months. I don't think, you know, just like any good chart, there's no up only, there's really no down only, there's going to be a bounce at some point. Uh, Mark Jeffrey, what are your thoughts on this? Are we, are we at the point of like seeing a little bit of a bounce here where the market kind of adjusts and, you know, unemployment tries to catch up with the, the restrictions put on the market and things like that? I mean, look, it's anybody's guess. It's, this is such a wild, ro uh, roller coaster of a time, right? Where, you know, yeah, Ukraine, we got so many things, macro things in play. Um, I, I, you know, my gut says that things are bouncing. Um, and, I, and I say that cautiously, but that is, I feel like 2023 is going to be a better year than we all think it will be. Um, and, you know, we've all seen the effect before where when everybody thinks something's going to happen, the opposite happens, right? So the super mm -hmm. cycle is definitely about to happen, then it doesn't happen. And instead, we get a crash. So I, I kind of feel like, I do feel like things are turning around. Uh, the situation in Ukraine, I think, is probably the one thing that could sort of you know, set everything back on fire again and head, make things head south again. So that's that's kind of my gut on it. Well, and the opposite on that is also true. I'm, go I'm glad you brought up Ukraine because there's been some interesting developments over there. So uh, the other day on Russian state TV, they said that the United States comments in regards to Crimea were equivalent to a declaration of war, to which I went, oh, shit. <laughs> Yeah. My wife, my wife was like, look, if we're actually getting bombed, you and I need to go out and get bombed. Like, you know, cause we're both sober. So that's kind of like our last ditch thought that, <laughs> yeah, if we're all going to die, we're going to get drunk. Um, but so there were some other things that are going on here that were very interesting. So you had China, you know, calling for peace talks. You have Russia saying we are open to a diplomatic resolve. And then on the back end, you have the United States you know, calling out China basically for for brokering a deal to sell a hundred of these attack drones to uh, to Russia. So, like, nobody really knows what's going on around here. Clay, do you have any information on China or just the overall situation in general? I don't know how you doing. Tell me about your day. No, yeah, of course. <laughs> I, <feel> China. <laughs> uh, I mean, not. I mean, I, I'm not sure whether like are, are they posturing to say that you know is this part of the narrative where you know they they position themselves as the good guys and say look we're calling for peace talks and by the way uh, the United States have been has been in 54 wars since it's, since in its its inception is a warmongering nation like that's basically 
what they're mm-hmm. you know, they're for, and and, and they're not wrong. Right? I, mean, we have, I think we've started in, or entered into most major wars, uh, and so you know. So I, I mean, look, what what could this do if it was to end abruptly? Like, obviously, that'd be great for supply chains. It'd be great for the economy. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think that it's going to happen in that way, and I don't think it's that easy. And I think that it is a lot of probably posturing from China. But uh, look on, on the macro stuff, like to Mark's point, like there's so many factors at this point that it is anybody's guess. Like, I, I, I think that we don't have the data that really dictates a recession. Like we've got super strong unemployment, uh, PCEs are going up. Like, I don't think that recession is really what we're looking at right now. It's inflation is the problem, which means that it's the feds problem, which means it becomes the market's problem. So rates higher for longer. I mean, there's already uh, future looking data that came out this morning that said there's going to be no, uh, fed fed rate high, or cuts, excuse me, this year. So, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's, you know, I feel like we, we spend a lot of time talking about it, but yet Bitcoin still seems to be fairly resilient given all the things that are going on. And if you look at the SPX, like I'm starting to go like, all right, like look at the S&P today. It opened uh, and dropped like, you know, 40 points or, or 100 points or somewhere in 60. It's back up already again. So like, I guess my point is like, are the markets going, you know what, this is the reality where we are. And like people are starting to trade around that. Like, it seems like things are still continuing on, man. So I don't know. It's, Interesting uh, point. You know, so there are if you I would encourage anyone to go look at the the block bites following list because we are following like a basket of really just amazing analysts on yeah. there. And a couple of them have thrown the word stagflation out there, which is something that um, a lot of your money managers seem to be pricing in. And stagflation is uh, it's essentially a situation in which the inflation rate is high or increasing, and I'm reading this off of Wikipedia, don't think I know this shit, Uh, the economic growth rate slows and unemployment remains steadily high. Now, we're not doing the unemployment rate thing yet, but essentially what it does is it presents a dilemma for economic policy, because remember, they only have a couple tools to work with, right? So actions intended to lower inflation, which are, you know, your raising of rates, your quantitative tightening, you know, dumping, getting money off the books, essentially, uh, may exacerbate unemployment. So I found that to be really interesting that a lot of your, your, your high, you know, caliber money managers are really pricing in a stagflation. Now, on the other side of this, and I want to kick over to the Bitcoin chart, because look, a lot of people will argue, uh, and and I would not necessarily disagree with them, that if you go back in the charts and you technically analyze the charts without the fundamental side next to it, the chart is going to do what it technically says it's going to do, right? It, it, regardless of what's happening fundamentally. So it we have an interesting... Uh, it's I know, Nick would be just... Nick yeah, would be rubbing my ass right now for this, but anyhow. So here I have, I have a prediction. Now I don't know if this is if this is going to be a prediction that plays out or not. But we have very very strong support down here at twenty one six. We have very very strong resistance up here in the I would say twenty four to twenty five range. Um, for us to have our inverted head and shoulders, which you've got left shoulder head, we need a right shoulder still. That right shoulder is going to need to come in between 18,000 and 20, uh, essentially. And it it would take a little while to play out. I potentially see a a head and shoulders playing out here. Uh, if we get, you know, if, if this is the way that it works, uh, we get a, we get a strong drop down into the, I would say 22,000 range, a bounce back up to retest again. Uh, and then a strong drop down below. Now that may take some fundamental news to make that happen, but guys, remember, Anything above 18.5, we're bullish. Uh, that, you know, 18.5 is kind of the bull's line in the sand. If we drop beneath that, you know, all bets are off. But right now, uh, we're in a bullish market. I think, I do think that we're seeing the beginnings of a new four year cycle. And so anything could happen. Uh, yeah. But I will tell you, China, China seems to be like unreasonably bullish uh, these days. Not China. Well, a lot of, a lot of China, uh, but the Chinese people also Hong Kong, also other aspects of Asia are like really seem to be bullish uh, these days on what the market is doing. And I think there's a lot of good reason to be bullish on crypto. And I think, you know, if you're somebody that watches dollar go up and dollar go down on your portfolio every day and stresses out thinking about, oh my God, I dropped 10 grand. uh, That is, you know, uh, you know, three months worth of food or whatever. And you're calculating in that way. I mean, crypto can be a really, really stressful thing, but The ones that have really made it, the ones that have really made it are the ones that bought low and were dumb enough to hold long enough to actually let the number go back up. And I'm one of them. Like I was dumb enough to hang on to something for a hundred plus X and, you know, change my life. 
And so who knows what the hell is going to happen, but I can ensure you at some point, at some point, at some point, probably this year, uh, we will, we will see liquidity back in the markets and, uh, number will go up. Okay. So let's kick over to our next topic, which is actually, I mean, I would say this is potentially a very, very important topic. And so Coinbase, uh, came out with base base chain, right? And base chain is going to be a layer two built on the optimism, uh, sub stack. I believe they call it. It will be a super chain secured by Ethereum, which layer twos are, they, they essentially print your transactions back to the main chain. There's going to be no token, uh, but apparently the roadmap will allow interoperability with other L2s. And I want to, you know what? I want to share this, uh, this tweet from Chris Black, who I would call him quite controversial uh, mm -hmm. in, in his tweets. He actually, I think he lives near me, uh, but he put out this and I, I really enjoyed this. Shut up, Chris. Coinbase can have its KYC L2. We'll keep using the other ones. Fool. All of the institutional liquidity that's currently sitting on the sidelines is about to stampede into base and make it the largest DeFi network in the world. And you sheep will follow. And he's probably not wrong <laughs> because if something ends up being the biggest DeFi network in the world where <laughs> all the liquidity is, I mean, it's got that network effect that you just want to be a part of. So let's, Mark, can I get you to kick this one off, man? What are your thoughts on on the announcement of base and, and what it might mean for the future going forward? Yeah, I, I thought about this one a lot, actually. I, you know, I, I, I'm sort of torn a little bit. I'm not as bullish. There's an off, you know, when these things happen, right? Especially since it's Coinbase, we're seeing all these like hyper bullish tweets, like, oh my God, game over. It's Coinbase, right? And my reaction to it was like, was initially, why? Why do we need yet another chain? I'm actually personally kind of exhausted by seeing new chains and new protocols ramp up and a bunch of money flow into them only to have them collapse. And then everybody's on to the next narrative and chain and thing. Right. So um, and even Coinbase, you know, their NFT marketplace didn't really make a giant dent in anything. So it's not, you know, that it's sort of like when Google releases a new product, pretty much every new product they release, everybody thought that it was going to be giant and, you know, 90% of them have failed. Right. They're not very good at it. So so I, I, I don't think that this is like an automatic win for Coinbase. You know, why a new chain? Well, I mean, I, they're, they're pitching it as we're making developer tools that make it easier for developers to uh, do things. And, and that doesn't exist yet. But, you know, if you listen to Andre and I listened to a bunch of Andre Kranje, um podcasts and talks last week, he's pitching the same thing with Phantom and he's been at it for years. And he already has momentum in that direction, I think significant momentum, as do some of the other chains. Um, whereas, you know, Coinbase is, or Base is kind of starting from zero on this. Um, but I, so I think the real point of it is, as that tweet mentioned, is KYC. And um, uh, my friend, some of my friends that did the Proton chain and also now the Libre chain, um, one of the key benefits of that is that the KYC is baked in at the chain level. And so, and, and, I, and I think that's really the only way that you can do it effectively and ensure that, you know, that wallet really is that human, right? Um, and, and so I think, but I, I do think that in order for mass adoption to occur, um, you have to, you have to make both the chain and the wallet. So it's got to be sort of like this Apple-like contraption where the, you have the, uh, you know, the easy, super easy consumer onboarding in the wallet. And the KYC and the identity baked in at the chain level, and both of those things have to fit together and work together. And so far from Coinbase, we've only heard about one half of the equation. They, you know, they may be, they may talk about the other half, but so far that you know, it's basically just a chain. So, and also the other, the other big minus about this this base chain is Coinbase is based in the United States. Gary Gensler could wake up at any moment and crush it. Right. So there, there is there is extreme risk just in that alone. Well, hold on. How, how could he? There's no token. There's nothing to crush. It's that, literally that it's like saying but that doesn't matter. Gary Gensler can declare anything as security he wants at any time. And, and you know, and, and, and he can have ridiculous reasoning for it. So, yes, I, I agree with you. He shouldn't be able to do that, but he could. Now, yeah. I don't I, do we know that this is KYC or is that just something people are saying? Uh, because how are you gonna how are you gonna have interoperability with other chains that are non KYC? Like how how is that? Are people just making that assumption because it's Coinbase? I haven't seen anywhere that says that. 
that this is a permissioned chain. That not, could not, be. not a permission, but a user KYC, like as in you know who the user is and you can carry that identity to other chains. That would like, be they talk that would be permissioned. You can't get you can't get on this chain without KYC and through Coinbase is permission. Oh, gotcha. That's not this is not a permission chain from what I can see. It's built on optimism. Like unless they put some sort of wall up that says you can't use it. Like I don't think that's the case. I do think I do think Coinbase spearheading this is very bullish for bringing liquidity into into the market if if that liquidity can go elsewhere. If it cannot, if it's a sandbox, then yeah. I would say, you know, who the who the hell knows? I mean, I I took it a little bit different than Mark and I I mean, really from the perspective of this is we have a major player in Coinbase. We have a, a very very outspoken and uh from what I've seen thus far strong-willed CEO and Brian Armstrong who has pushed back on Pretty much every step that the SEC's made specifically, uh, and really push back on on the fact that there's you know there's unfair regulation and there's not enough transparency and clarity into any type of like you know what are the rules of crypto. So having somebody this large with a vested interest in building on Web three and you know specifically making Ethereum work well, uh, and also like if it look if they're being genuine, then it's actually like easy for builders. Then I see it as a huge positive. I mean, you know I, I know that. Uh, there's been a ton of tweets about how many users and how much money is sitting in Coinbase, but 110 million. If 20% of those users migrate, that's like a it's like a 20x of what we have in total, you know, crypto users today. So uh, I think that that's you know, th there's just there's a lot of reasons that this could be a really really positive thing. Like it's positive for Ethereum. It's hella positive for Optimism. I mean, my God, like that's you know they they just proved their use case uh, of you know other people building layer twos with their tech of being that out of the box you know, build your own layer two and it's easy to do. Oh, and by the way, we'll help one of the biggest institutions in the space do it uh, as a partner. I mean, that's incredibly uh, bullish for them. And so, you know, I think ultimately, look, if it works, what kind of framework does it set for for TradFi or for FinTech or for other folks that look around this ecosystem and go, all right, we weren't sure if we wanted to do this, but Coinbase has successfully pulled it off. Now we're actually interested in doing it. Oh, and by the way, they, they didn't do it with a token. So we don't have to worry about the security aspect. So I think there's a lot of things that remain to be seen in terms of how this is going to play out, but um, it, it's definitely not a, a bearish thing. That's for sure. Well, and you know, DeFi, the, the actual amount of users in DeFi compared to the, the right. total addressable market is like non-existent. Yeah. It's nothing. Right. And, and I would, I would also submit that now this is a complete assumption and a guess, but I would say of all the exchanges, uh, if you were to look at all the exchanges out there with the number of, you know, customer accounts that actually use DeFi, I'll bet you Coinbase is one of the ones with a massive delta between the amount of users that have the ability to use DeFi and understand it and the ones who don't. Because right. Coinbase is where my grandfather goes to buy a Bitcoin, a share in Bitcoin, you might yeah. call it. You know what I mean? <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> Corval, <laughs> what do you got, brother? Oh, no, I was just agreeing with you. Um because I was thinking the same thing. Like, my dad doesn't know anything about anything. He'll, like, send me text messages asking about, like, pee pee poo poo coin, if I should buy it or whatever. Um, and so there is also a level of security when, like, if you're if you're not, like, as uh, involved in, in crypto, right? You don't read, like, a bunch of news about it. You're not, like, talking. You're not watching across the chains or whatever. Uh, t just telling someone to just go on Coinbase is probably, like, the safest bet. Like you're not gonna like, you know, get your keys stolen off of Coinbase. Just interacting with Coinbase. Hey, Ooh, double oh, sharp. Oh, look world. at this. Look at this uh, guy. What's up, man? Hello. Good, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'll just tie it off. I'll just say, uh, I, yeah, I agree with Clay. I agree. It's it's a it's a great sign. It's very bullish. I think uh, for them if they can pull it off. Uh, we'll see mm -hmm. how it plays out. Because like Mark says, there is a element of execution this is just like an announcement we have to see something executed for it to really be worth anything yeah here, I, here. I do wonder like my, my like i had a number of questions one of which was who, who's going to be like the big and first builders to go over there like who's leaving the DeFi ecosystem to go build on base and is it going to well, be there's a huge they get a, a list, list. Oh, they, yeah, they a included list. like 40 logos and they're not leaving the DeFi ecos they're not like uh, they're uh, just oh, sending screw you ethereum i'm going to base Obviously. like they're just going over there and it's everyone it's literally all of your okay, i didn't know there was already a list well then oh yeah there's the questions list. answered huge yeah if you did the reading so, you know there was a list 
Okay. If you had done the reading, <laughs> I, I did. I did the reading. I didn't see the sign. You wrote the reading, so I don't know. He wrote the reading. I wrote the reading. Double sharp. You got any any feelings on uh, on base? Um, a little bit. I so I got about twenty million uh, DMs that said affect like some of them literally just said base, and I was like, what is what is going on? Um, I think uh, I don't know if Clay maybe what he read or didn't. I I read through a lot of their stuff, and it was actually kind of um, hard to to find some of the details. Like found out they have a. They're going to have like a grants program, but it was buried down at the bottom of a blog post with a link to a Google form that had more information on it and stuff. So it's not super, um, you know, super well organized out there yet. It does seem like they have obviously generated a ton of um, buzz. They they do have like a list of, you know, well-known uh, protocols and projects that are moving over there. They've got this grant program, it's Coinbase, so on and so forth. So I think that they're... Um, probably going to at least get a lot of attention and, and you know pop right away haven't seen a ton of details on the technical uh, implementations to speak you know to how that would work and uh, i was actually honestly kind of um <laughs> kind of uh surprised yeah it was i think it was actually literally maybe bebus that sent me something that said base but um it's <laughs> i was I was surprised that they got so much attention when they're, you know, at the bottom of their announcement, it says like, please follow us to find out when we're on the main net. Um, so they, you know, they're still pr obviously, you know, very new. So I think a lot more information will come out, but you know, from the specs and stuff that they're sort of uh, putting in their marketing material, it sounds exciting. Well, I want to say that like from a, from a, you know, we're looking at this from an overall crypto standpoint, but from a business standpoint, this is a, this is a good move. Yeah, yeah, they've done something well Huge. for their shareholders. I looked up, I looked up coin stock as soon as they announced it. I was like, hmm, like this is not, now it's a lot more interesting <laughs> than it was before. Yeah, but from as the, the, the potential avenues to drive revenue within having your own chain are like you can get creative yep. with that. You know, there's a lot that can be done. Yeah, it's a great so move, but I'm overall <laughs> bullish on it too. I just wanted, you know, I sounded kind of bearish before. I, you know, it it is a good thing. I just have some, you know, those are my doubts. The other thing yeah. I, I'd mentioned is I had on hash rate a guy named Bill Barheit this past week. Uh, do you guys know him? He's he's the CEO mm -hmm. of Abra. Um, okay, yeah, he's been around for a while and a very 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 smart guy. Um, and he he basically said, you know, look, I talked to a lot of institutional players and they see the yields on DeFi and they're you know he described them as you know they're DeFi curious, uh, but at the same time <laughs> the overarching narrative in their brain is SPF and Luna, you know, and all the yeah. hangover from 2022. So somebody like Coinbase comes along and presents them those yield numbers uh, and they seem legitimate and they legitimize the space and it feels more safe Then you know, these giant players on the sidelines will come in and they are there yeah. and they are waiting and they do want to find a ramp into this world. And, you know, you bring up a really good point because you were giving that talk the other day to folks that <clears throat> they have an idea about crypto, but they have the wrong idea about yeah. crypto and the crypto curious. We've got to get them through the door. If they're through the door, yeah. they'll get the bug. And that's yep. where I see this being a really huge benefit. Go ahead, Clay, sir. Uh, so I I, uh, I interviewed or did a spaces yesterday with with all the solid uh, many of the solidly forks and it was quite quite an interesting conversation. There's a ton of cool uh, information in it. It's on our YouTube if you want to check it out. But uh, what I didn't get to ask Velodrome, what I would have liked to ask was this exact question. Like, what is your, you know, because of this super chain idea, you have to imagine, and I think they've already stated, there's going to be probably a pretty seamless bridge between optimism and the space, um, you know, L2. So if you're a protocol that is building or has built on uh, optimism, you've got to be going, hmm, this could get interesting. It may be a year and a half before it matters, but you have to, you know, I, I do wonder kind of what they're thinking from that side and th think like a Beethoven, right? From phantom beethoven decided to go multi-chain they partnered with balancer they end up on optimism you know it might in in retrospect in two years from now it might end up being a genius move um more circumstance than maybe they had a planning but still like i'm curious you know i'll be curious to see how that narrative plays out and what the actual protocols that are on there if they're having conversations with the optimism senior leadership and saying what could this mean for us in a year and a half because i think it could be very very interesting I mean, it's a mass flood of liquidity from base to optimism. That's beneficial for every protocol on there. Interesting. And, you know, this kind of, so I was listening to, you know, a small plug for the Byte Masons. I was listening to their town hall the other day. 
chatting about ethos and they said, well, you know, optimism is going to be our first deployment. And like, we're putting a big focus there. And I knew Beavis and, and co had gotten close to the optimism guys. Mm -hmm. And then a couple days later, this news was dropped. I was like, wow, maybe there's a, like a real, so I know like, Beavis has hard nipples over this. There's no question. I see him in the chat. I know he's very, very excited. Yeah, I mean, so. you could think that it's it's a conversation I would, I would have liked to have at least had with them, but didn't couldn't do it in the forum because there were four other protocols from other chains, so it didn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. Well, All right, let's. Uh, I I, do, I want to add one thing before we move on. Um, just regarding the optimism, um, you know, partnership or whatever it is. That was another thing I I sort of got more information on digging into their what their grants program was. It like explicitly calls out on the form that they are partnered with Optimism and that the base team is joining the core Optimism development team yep. and it's going to be contributing to yep. the open source stack and all that. So it sounds like they are working very closely together. Oh, one one more thing exactly what he just said. I was like, "Wait a second. I saw Recently, like I saw, like um, it might have been a year ago, that uh, Anderson Horowitz, A16Z, invested in the C uh, Series B round on Optimism. It was like it was like 150 million bucks. And then I went and was like, how much shares do they own of like how much ownership do they have of Coinbase? And it was like 939 million dollars in shares. I was like, I wonder if that was like the intro connection point. Like if A16Z connected, then they're like, look, we we own a decent percentage of both these things. Like you guys should sit down and talk. You know, they. uh now, I don't know if, if it's not possible, but there was a long time there where like the rumors were, were floating about how much Coinbase loved Polygon and, and all this stuff. And, you know, mm -hmm. Polygon's coming out with their ZKL2 uh, yeah. like at some point. So it's I, I'm, I'm very interested that they went with Optimism. I know Optimism is largely a US, US based team. I think they're a bunch of Silicon Valley yeah. guys. Uh, so that may have played a role as well. OK, let's move us on. So not to beat a dead horse. Well, I shouldn't call him a horse, but anyhow, uh, SBF is, you know, he's been in hot water. We're going to keep talking about him though, because there was a superseding indictment that was issued for him with, I believe 12 charges. And I'm going to, I'm going to go through these with you, but, uh, if he found guilty on all charges from three government bodies and, and I'm sure he won't, uh, but he stares down a maximum sentence of 115 years in jail and let me i want to share screen because i have the actual the actual dealio pulled up here uh boop, 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 boop. there it is okay so i want to scroll down to just show you some of these and there's some gold in here like if if you you know if you're on the toilet print the sucker out and bring it in uh so conspiracy to commit wire fraud we know that wire fraud conspiracy to commit fraud on customers of ftx blah 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 the new one though like, I mean, a few of these are new, but they're kind of like repeats. They're just variations on fraud. Uh, the new one and the really fun one is number 12 here. Conspiracy to make unlawful political contributions and defraud the Federal Election Commission, I believe is what they're called. Now, I've had a lot of time to think about this. We talked about it in our show the other day. Um, and I'm wondering, with this charge, is this charge potentially a way to ensure the politicians are insulated, to say, we've convicted this man of fraud, so clearly he gave this to you on fraudulent pretenses, and so we will not come after you for accepting the money. Do you get where I'm going with this? Like, is issuing this charge against him a way of insulating? Now, not that the politicians were probably ever gonna face any charges. I mean, there's kid diddlers on the on the bench and they're not going to jail, but like, like do you guys get what I'm saying with this? Like, is there a, an alternative reason for this particular charge uh let's start it off with clay we haven't started with clay clay let's talk about sbf how many Man, cucumbers was, does I, it take was, to sustain I, him for 115 was, years i'm the wrong guy to go to i was looking for sbf pictures because I, I wanted some uh some good screen stuff here so let's uh, <laughs> go over to mark I, like honestly right. i, I kind of heard what you said here's my thing like I don't even want to take it the conspiratorial route because the guy just he, he committed so so many crimes uh and it's so blatant that you know like look on in terms of like the uh the you know basically you know going to washington and giving out you know money and and and, and being a crook there's usually two sides to people that are crooks there's there's crooks on both sides of those sort of shady agreements so i'm so like did other people do things that are bad probably will it ever come out i doubt it um, but I don't, you know, I don't particularly, I mean, look, he's, he's going to fry is basically what it comes down to, but and I, I don't really care if anybody else goes down with him. 
Uh, I'm more so happy that this this industry as crypto got rid of this guy. We were this close to it not happening. Uh, and I think in, in two years, we're going to look back and this is going to be like a saving grace of crypto is that SBF actually went down. Uh, he actually got put away and there's actual, you know, this hopefully pumps real legislative change that uh, shit like this can't happen again. And so, you know, for me, I actually think that the, the silver lining is, is in what comes next. Um, and that, yeah, it was a bad time and it, it brought Bitcoin down. But you have to remember this guy was before Congress literally, uh, you know, helping draft proposals that were going to work in his favor and schmoozing and offering money to groups of, you know, basically lobbying uh, for, you know, for legislation that was going to, you know, make him in a better spot. So think how scary that is that that didn't, you know, it didn't play out, but how scary it is if it had. So you know, that's my, my look, he's going to jail and rightfully so. And so that's all I got. And do you know, you know, <laughs> I'm going to get shit for saying this, but you guys know who sounded the alarm bigger than anyone on this guy, right? It's easy. Well, not really. BitBoy. Ah. He, it was him. He was the one screaming that this guy was the absolute Ooh. devil and nobody believed it yet. So I think anyhow, Kate Long was also. Probably. She's yeah. awesome. People should she know is. who she is. Uh, over to you, Mark. Let's round robin the sucker. Yeah, so I don't think, I mean, I I, I, I don't understand how it could be a, a conspiracy to insulate the, 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 the politicians. Well, I do think the politicians are largely, we do have a lot of really bad humans doing bad things uh, in our government right now. Uh, I, you know, accepting campaign contributions from kind of anyone, uh, you know, if they're not proven to be a criminal yet, uh, I, I don't see how that is a, a crime or a, a bad thing. And I don't think they could, I don't think they could screen everyone to make sure that they're not a criminal, right? Yeah, so I think, not their job. Yeah, it's not their job. And I, and I honestly think that taking money and then later finding out that it was stolen or whatever, that's not on you, however bad a person you may be or not, right? So, um, but I think, I mean, I think SBF has said, you know, publicly that, or not publicly, but we've, we found out through his emails or something, I can't remember what, but, but basically he was very loud about our uh, democratic uh, contributions because that was hip. Uh, but the conservatives and the Republican side, he was very quiet about. So that, you know, he's basically said, we, we don't talk about those, but we still do them. Um, and he says, in, in, you know, this, this, um, this new document says that there were 300 contributions totaling $10 million. And he used something called straw donors. Uh, which sounds sort of like yep, shell yep. companies, but for donating to uh, political causes. And you know, I'm not an expert on that, but that's what it sounds like to me. Um, internally, their their uh, spreadsheets show that they made $100 million in contributions. So those, those two numbers don't totally match up. And Elon Musk has come out publicly and said he thinks it's closer to a billion dollars in political contributions. And how he knows that or why he suspects that, I don't know. But that's that was he's like, no, it's it's about a billion dollars is, is what he's what he said. So. So uh, he was absolutely buying political influence. Um, it, it didn't work, obviously. Uh, yeah. And I and I do think. Look, I think at the end, he somehow he he largely gets off. I still say that. I still say that's the way it's going to go down. Even though it looks like every agency on earth is currently charging him with breaking every single law. And I think it's you know this will go on. He'll be in court for a while, but it'll really be at his parents' house, and then somehow he'll get a slap on the wrist. That's where I think it goes. Did you guys see this? So that was the picture I was looking for. That's why. I yeah. Was I wasn't, Gen I wasn't, Genevieve, I she's a money manager. I don't know. But this caption, right? Record scratch freeze frame. You're probably wondering how I ended up here. Like that is every 1990s movie ever. Dude, that's oh, so man. good. I mean, I'm, I'm tired of looking at his dead eyes, honestly. Like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sick of the, uh, the SPF topics. Yeah. Well, Corgal. you're going to keep seeing them, dude. You're going to keep right, seeing them yeah. because I think this is, uh, uh, one of those examples of uh they just want to hit him with literally everything to make like an example like there's like the modern like tar and feathering you know like you can't really like put him out in the streets and beat him to make the people happy but you can say we're going to give you 50 million life sentences and shoot you into the sun or whatever uh i mean he's he's going away for if he gets convicted he's going away for a long time no matter how many charges they hit him with i mean he's got like five wire <laughs> like five wire charge frauds man they're like that's like a lot that's a it's lot. A lot. Like just, just one of those is enough to ruin your life forever. Every um, flavor of fraud out there this man has. So Yeah. I mean, the 
the political stuff i think one of the better things to take away from that other than like the conspiracy i mean like obviously our politicians like to take money they don't really care who it comes from um how beholden they are to those people once they get to power who knows but the the thing i take from it is like it, this guy was supposed to be like the head of ftx he's supposed to be like a wonderkind right but his focus was so much like so split like because he spent so much time in congress talking to politicians and uh that should be kind of a warning sign maybe going forward maybe if a guy is making such a big deal out of how much he's like involved in politics when he's not a politician uh should be kind of like a warning for how he's running his business um but a hey, hindsight's 2020 <laughs> indeed indeed double sharp wrap us up on this one buddy what are your thoughts i don't really have any thoughts? I think I have a cutoff for talking about people. I, apparently, um, I don't. Really? I don't have. Yeah. yeah, I don't have that much of an opinion. I think he's he's probably going to end up in jail. I think you know plenty yeah. of other people who are high profile who've donated money to people have done illegal things. Many of them have ended up in jail. Maybe he gets away. Hard it's old say. news. So let let's make a gentleman's agreement right now. I'm using that term loosely. We're not going to talk about SBF on this show anymore, unless unless there's it's just so juicy. You know, it's like we just can't. Yeah. Like this wasn't super juice. Like we could yeah. have gone without. Oh, he got some new charges. Fuck yeah, let's move on. For the, for the 55 know? watching, remember this moment. Somebody screenshot it and uh, also like the video. But remember that Austin said that. So when it comes back, you can uh, troll him hard. <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't do the topic, so if it comes uh, back, it's on you, true. Palio. All right, <laughs> let's keep this going. So there's been a huge narrative in the market recently, and a lot of your bigger like shows are discussing this, and I think there's a lot of merit to it, and it's it's the Asian influence right now, right? There's a lot happening. <laughs> there's a huge liquidity injections going on over in China, like record-breaking. Um, Hong Kong has come out and said that they want they have a plan to move towards full legalization of crypto for their for their people. And at the same time, they just passed out a bunch of stimmies, I noticed. Uh, but so the, uh, the crypto in Hong Kong is a really interesting one, because if you guys know the history of Hong Kong, they so ch they were a Chinese nation. Then they went over to the British for a period of 100 years. I don't remember the exact deal. Uh, sometime in the 90s, they went back to being Chinese. And that's why Hong Kong is kind of interesting, because it has a very big Western influence while also having, you know, the beauty of Asia and all of that. But the, the finance secretary of in Hong Kong called Web3 a golden opportunity. Now, you and I and everyone watching knows China FUD has always been a thing, right? Every couple of years, the Chinese have just said, up, oh, crypto is illegal again and done away with it. Uh, well, Hong Kong's top finance minister pledged support for Web3, including fresh investment as the city signals its reopening to the industry. But what's interesting here. According to Bloomberg, officials from China's liaison office, now this is really important, have been frequent guests at crypto gatherings in Hong Kong. And the tone of their visits and follow-up calls with certain projects has been friendly. And so it almost sounds like there's a little wink, wink, nod, nod, you know, say no more for any of my Monty Python friends um, going on over for, for Hong Kong. And this could be a big deal because, I mean, let's face it, Dude. China's China's a big boy. It is a big and I, boy. I I think, you know, there's a lot happening out there right now. And there's a lot of there seems to be a lot of a lot of news articles popping up about this country's deciding to move away from the dollar. This country's and that is like the narrative, like moving away from the world's, you know, reserve currency. Um, China's a big one and they can move markets. And if if that population gets mobilized, hang on. So I'm interested to know what you guys think about this. How about this one, Clay? Would you start this one for us? <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, so you you said something there that I want to reiterate because it was easy to miss. City signals it's reopening to the industry. So Hong Kong has been closed off to the crypto industry. That's, that's a big deal. Why is that a big deal? Um, well, they've got the Hong Kong Stock Exchange with 2,500 companies listed and 47 trillion in controlled assets under asset managers in Hong Kong. Uh, that's sort of like saying New York City is now going to be exceptionally uh, open and uh, and and sort of like um, you know like open to the idea of and they already are in this market somewhat, but like they're gonna they're actually gonna step in and lean in to getting into crypto potentially. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a mass, I think it's a massive opportunity uh, for crypto. And I think it's a much bigger deal than people realize because they've been out of the game and absolutely unable to get in. So there's a ton of money sidelined. Um, and I know that earlier this year, the, so like it's not just 
um, you know, that they're they're considering the Securities and Futures Commission of Hong Kong actually is, issued new consultations like earlier this year uh, that investors of all types could access virtual trading platforms and assets. So they're not just saying that this is institutional money. It's actually, you know, anybody that's uh, you know within their jurisdiction. So I think it's, you know, it's bigger than we think it is potentially. Interesting. D Double sharp. I want to kick it over to you. How much of this? So, you know, the old saying nature abhors a vacuum. Now, I don't know if, if Gensler's creating a vacuum necessarily, but he's definitely creating an opportunity. And I want to know, like how, you know, it seems to me that these countries that are on their toes are going, oh, these guys are screwing it up. Keep going, man. We'll take that. We'll take that. What are your thoughts on that? Double sharp. What, what does the Asian influence actually mean? If anything? Um, I mean, I think it from a, you know, a capital flow perspective it makes a big deal like it's like you were saying like china and asia have you know really large populations there's a lot of um, money flowing through you know asia in, in general um and so if if it's not available to be in the crypto market then that's you know it's just not there so once if they are leaning into it and then all of you know whatever percentage of the population wants to participate that's going to be a significant amount more involvement in in crypto um, and then, you know, just in general, if countries are sanctioning uh, a technology, that usually means that they are, you know, going to be, you know, promoting it through their education system, providing, you know, some sort of often there's like uh, subsidies and stuff like that to help promote it. So if they are seeing this as a, a new, you know, technology that's that is, you know, shifting um, how things are done globally then maybe you know you do change your perspective lean into it and then it it does you know make sense that you're able to like leapfrog over the the early adopters like us um us for example in terms of you know if it actually attracts a bunch of developers away from the united states or whatever i don't i i still think that it probably doesn't like i'm sure that some people uh end up moving to to places that are more friendly just um because that that makes sense to me but i don't think that it's like some huge mass migration i think it's um probably more about people who are um you know have lots of of crypto flowing through their wallets and tax implications to people personally if they're going to like move to a different country but just i mean just in general that's like a huge increase to the population of people participating in crypto Dude, you brought up such a good point that did not cross my mind. I mean, with the government subsidization and, uh, you know, if if it does become legal and adopted and, and instituted as part of their education system where kids are growing up to know that, okay, Web3 has this role within our, within our society, right? That makes it a viable option. Uh, for people as an educational track or, and, and this is a lot of people that is, that's no joke. I mean, that is the insurance of the future of, of web three right there. I mean, that one move could, could change a lot. Corval thoughts. Yeah. I've got, a, I've got a lot of thoughts on this. Uh, so I, I met this Goldman Sachs banker. I interviewed with him when I got out of college uh, and I had asked him a lot in the interview, probably too much. It's probably why I didn't get the job, but I kept asking him about investing in China. And uh, the thing he always, he told me is that uh, it's all about the CCP in China. Like if it's all by the light of the CCP and it's all based off of their uh, tendencies in the moment, right? So like whether a business flourishes or collapses and it's the same with crypto, um, you know, I keep, I've been joking about this. It's like, when are they going to like ban it again? Because over the last like four years, they've banned it, unbanned it, banned it, unbanned it. And it really is kind of just reactionary to kind of what whatever needs they're trying to service at the moment. And things get even more complicated with Hong Kong because Hong Kong is supposed to be a special administrative zone. Um, and they're trying to bring it into the fold. If you remember the protests uh, a few years ago, uh, they were pretty, pretty violent. Um, so, yeah, so this could be huge for crypto, right? If China goes full bore into it, like you're saying, um, then like, yeah, that's like a billion people that are going to be raised uh, with the idea of like crypto is a legitimate path. This is how you're going to like work, like training people how to use it. Um, but it's also likely that, you know, they've, they've been going through some tough times recently with the COVID, the reaction to COVID lockdowns, uh, their housing market collapse. Um, a lot of Chinese citizens don't really have a lot of like extra money to throw around. Um, actually, I think they have a higher savings rate than we do, but they don't tend to invest it in speculative assets 
other than housing. They tend to buy housing more. Um, Hong Kong is the biggest, biggest deal here because Hong Kong is like a, the financial center of Asia. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Um, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I wanted to. We so got a super I, I didn't, chat here. <laughs> yeah, we do. I didn't even know we had super chats. Mr. Got Plenty, you're the man, dude. Thanks for doing that. Do you think CZ will get some payback against Paxos, the SEC, and others who have crossed him in the industry? Thanks for the info. Uh, you know, honestly, I kind of do. Like, well, I, how? You know, what's he going to well, do? Well, so I don't know how. And I don't know if, if payback is the right word, but I think some, like, what do you call it? Uh, when somebody's like absolved or shit, I'm not thinking of the right word, not absolution, but like, like he'll come out looking good here. Uh, it'll come out that like he's, he's abiding by the laws and Binance will continue to thrive and it will turn out that it was all basically for nothing. So will he come out and get, you know, retribution? I don't know. But I, will I he come it. out and figure out a way to make it work for him? Probably because yeah. they're a huge ass company with very, very smart, uh, people on the on the. But they payroll. also have so, Binance US, so like it's it's kind of hard to say you're going to get retribution against Gary Gensler or the SEC when you have a regulated entity in an exchange here in America. Dude, that, according that all, to according to the actual rules or whatever it is, they don't own Binance US. I mean, no. even though we know that they do, no, it's a completely separate company owned by a separate company with every everything is separate. They're leasing the trademark is the way that that works. So, Got it. Uh, well, just an FYI, I, I just vindicated. Really, Yes, back, that's the one. And you tried to buy Voyager for a billion dollars and the SEC rejected it. And I'm sure there was various reasons as to why. But I, I just I don't think that uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe they have, you're saying they have nothing to do with one another. Is that what you're telling? That's me? the actual like on paper thing. Uh, CZ does not own it. Mark Jeffrey, what are your thoughts on the uh, on the Asian the Asian invasion here? I think it's pretty clear that something big is happening. Uh, you know, I, and, 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 and partly the reason I think that. Uh, and I hate to say this, but I'm going to anyway. His Excellency Justin Sun uh, has been all a Twitter about this on Twitter and basically saying a lot of good things about China and Hong Kong in particular and love that guy or hate that guy. Tron is like, you know, 10 percent of, <laughs> uh, of uh, right of DeFi. Right. So yeah. it's not nothing. And uh, and Justin Sun is, you know, he's high up in a tree. Uh, way further up than all of us are. And he can see a lot of things we can't. And he's talking to a lot of people we're not. And he is very clearly seeing that something big is going on in China, or at least he thinks so. And uh, and so I, I think I think it's real. And I think that, you know, it's it, China doesn't have to choose one direction or another, right? They could be non-binary. They yeah, can, but- uh, you know, have Hong Kong be capitalist and aggressive while the rest of China outlaws crypto and is is regressive, right? So... So I think that's how they're, I think that's how they're playing it. Now, well, and now, there's a, go ahead. Mark go ahead, brought sir. up the, the the point that we missed, which was Hubio Global, which is Justin Sun's exchange. What, moving wait, what? what, what was it? Huobi Global? Huobi? Yeah. Hobi? Yeah, I, I don't know. What do you mean? <laughs> Hoboken? Yeah, uh, Hubio is a better name. I enjoyed that one. Get out of here. Uh, <laughs> they they want to move the exchange from Singapore to Hong Kong. So of course he's going to be exceptionally uh, bullish over what's what's happening because it sounds like that could actually happen. So yeah. that's a Mark, he may be instrumental great. in making it happen. I mean the guy's also a Chinese. You know, he's, a, he's a diplomat. He's a Chinese born diplomat. So I'm sure he probably has a lot of information that we don't. To your point, Mark. Well, yeah. um, and the fact that like like I go back to the original thing. Since 2018, institutions have been barred from buying crypto. Regular people have been barred from buying crypto since 2018, and now that might all change. And there's 40, you know. A massive trillion dollar market in uh, Hong Kong for their exchange or for their stock. You know, market. there's more to that, and that you know, the Tron offices in San Francisco were raided. Like that, the Chinese government came after him. Yeah, like, there's a reason he's the his excellency now. Like, he, like on know? the run, like from China, almost. Well, like he's, he's got like, diplomatic immunity at this yeah, point. Yeah. That was the point. Citizenship. I don't know how much he had to pay for that. That was like a big golden he, passport. There. Here's a fun perspective on it. So, like, you know, a lot of like someone brought up in the chat that a lot of ccp officials have a lot of money and they're afraid of of, of xi jinping right because it's like very much kind of like a authoritarian style party structure 
uh, and he has done a lot of things where he's trying to like reduce their ability to buy foreign land assets because that's just money leaving China. Like they've their gra the graft that they've taken, they're trying to like push it out of the country. So in case shit goes down, they can flee. And crypto is really good, <laughs> really good for that. If you can on ramp into crypto, then you don't need to buy houses in in America or whatever. You can just buy a bunch of Ethereum, or Bitcoin, or whatever. That's um, true. Yeah, maybe that's what uh what I mean, and maybe Justin Sun's just a visionary, dude. He launched his own, he launched Tron. I hear people I'm I don't have anything against Tron. I like Tron, but uh, I hear a lot of people call it uh <laughs> his personal bank account. Maybe that's a so. uh, maybe I that's how that. the direction we're going. There may be a bigger story here though, in that and Clay and I were talking about this earlier, that the you know, like when we have these conversations, India doesn't generally come up as like a financial superpower mm -hmm. um because they're you know they're a relatively impoverished country but uh they are a very forward thinking now the, the government is not but the people of india like india is has a strong crypto presence right and and i think the government like they initially did this is outlawed and i think they're pulling back on that as of now and i wonder if somebody saw this and said yo there's a power play here like if we can become a dominant force in a financial market that is outside of the us dollar controlled financial market we have a real opportunity to become a power player in the future should this succeed yeah but you think it's against india though like honestly like if you look no, at GDP, i don't think it's against anyone okay. i don't think it's against anyone but i think in a world yeah. where where things are shifting in a world yeah. where the united states once again has pissed off everyone uh, and, and where they're once again, exerting, you know, force that they, that they believe they have. Right. I think there's a real move here because for the, it's not just for an ordinary citizens that can escape the banking system, but like the there's countries. a lot of it's countries too. The exactly. Countries punch above their weight. And yeah. exactly. Yeah. They see it. There's more to this, I think. And so I think whatever country really rips into this because look, if you if when I think about China, right, and in in, you know, obviously China is a communist country, um, strong government. Oh, my little girl's out there screaming for me. Uh, here, come here. You want to be on camera? Come here, baby. Uh, <laughs> Hi, sweetie. We're gonna pause. We have a guest. Everyone can, everyone can meet Delilah. <laughs> Hi, Delilah. Hello. Ask her what she thinks about China. Yeah. What do you think about China, baby? Good. She said good. Oh, China's good. good. Okay, that's a buy right. signal five for it. Oh, then he's fired. Oh, Demi's yeah. in the potty. Okay. She said Demi's potty and kids have no filter. Um, anyhow, but I think there's a power play here. That's all I wanted to say. She's probably yeah. going to hang out while we, while we, I mean, of course there's, you've got, you've got Gensler wrecking our opportunities to actually be a superpower in the web three space because he's pushing all the business international. Like if you're China, you wake up in the morning and go, this is a great opportunity. Us has $23.3 .3 trillion GDP. We've got 17.7. This could open the door to like mass amounts of innovation and mass amounts of, uh, you know, future of business for us. So I agree. Bro. With or it could be the exact opposite, dude. We're gonna get national blockchains all KYC walled off walled gardens, bro. <laughs> Cyberpunk future. Wow. <laughs> all right, let's go, let's go, let's go. We have we... a double card fake on Phantom. Uh well it's not Phantom, it's a multi chain topic. It's great that know, you're like, attaching it to Phantom. First one to integrate not... it. All right, all right. Oh, all right, it's a right, test right. net run. It was the first let's, try. Let's right. talk about it. Why not? So, uh, ZK router for a second. Let's get into that. Where the hell is it in, on the list here, Clay? Oh, yeah, it's up top. That's where it is. Okay. So, the ZK router test net. So, you guys might have seen Andre retweeting a multi chain tweet the other day where uh, the first bridge using a ZK router was done, I believe, from a was it Ethereum to Phantom, yep. if I'm not mistaken? And they yep. put up this big, big article. So, the ZK router test net is live which will allow bridging, I guess, initially between ETH and Phantom, or it's going to launch soon. And the ZK router implements ZK proofs for verification when bridging. And honestly, a lot of this was like way above my pay grade. So I was trying to like understand what are the examples here? Uh, like, what does this actually mean? And so they have yeah. some language that kind of is in English that I'm going to read to you guys. It says asset cross-chain bridge on-chain Oracle, multi-chain contract interoperability. I hope you're ready, Double Sharp. Cross-chain swap, multi-chain issuance of tokens and NFTs. ZK Router would enable the protocol to handle these different scenarios and also access to existing proofs of previous transactions in order to support current transactions. Seems and they big. gave like, they gave a, they gave an example of like having a lending position over on 
ETH and then collateralizing it over on Phantom or something like that. Double Sharp, you're nodding, which comforts me. Let's let you kick this one yeah, off, sir. Yeah, Double Sharp, my, as you explain this, like Juan put out a tweet. It was like, do you see the future yet, Anon, or something? Juan's been, he's been on one lately. He's been on but, fire. Uh, dude, he's been, he's been like straight up causing battles with other chains. Like, <laughs> and it's been pretty incredible to see. But uh, I don't, I, so like, yeah, I see the future. You can bring things from Ethereum and, and, and borrow against it. But like, is there, am I missing something? Is there more? Um, Yes and no. It's. It, I think like part of it is that it, at its core, it is a simple idea of it's sort of like how how chains work today, right? Like you take assets on one chain, deposit them. You have other servers that kind of look at it and say yes, that those assets are really in this contract. So now we're going to all agree that this person should be able to withdraw assets on some other chain. It's you know that takes a lot of different. Uh, if if you're going to decentralize it, you have a lot of different participants sort of validating that that transaction's legit and that you really have these assets on the other chain and that they were really issued on this new chain and all of that sort of stuff. Um, really what this does is uses ZK proofs to, um, you know, I think I've explained this before, but zero knowledge proofs are basically at its core a way of proving that you know something without revealing details about that, um, you know, giving away too much information about um, how you you know that so you can say like yes I really have this amount of money but you don't have to show your bank account and all the transactions for example so in this case they're using zk proofs to um, show like you're generating a proof that shows that yes you do have these assets on this chain they have been deposited in such and such way therefore you're able to transmit just this one proof you don't need a, a large consensus around it because it's using um, cryptography in that proof to say it's legit we don't need a bunch of people to agree this this mathematical uh, you know, algorithm, when we run it, it, it shows that this is legit, so we're gonna execute it. And so once you're able to do that, that's where multi-chain is talking about it being more efficient. Um, you don't need to have all the servers working on um, agreeing that this one bridge transaction was legit. You can now have lots of them handling individual transactions because they can all verify and move stuff around without needing this, this larger group of servers. Um, and then that enables things like cross-chain uh, messaging and, and you know trusting data from another chain like I think they mentioned oracles so if you wanted to know what something is trading at on another chain you can use zk router to request that information it sends it back and then because it's wrapped up in a zk proof you know that you can trust um, that that data is legit so it it does um, sort of blur the lines between being able to transmit data between blockchains a lot of times um, you'll think about things needing to to be, you know, they have to to execute and they have to uh, be on chain to be trusted and, and you, you know, all that sort of stuff that you usually think about with crypto. Some of that sort of goes away when you're able to use a ZK proof because now you don't need to be able to necessarily have that transaction on your chain to trust it. You can use a mathematical proof to, to look at something from Ethereum and know that you can trust it on Phantom to make whatever entry you want. I think they're they're talking about bridging and messaging and um you know lots of uh, different different applications and the reality is that it is a sort of a generic technology that that can be used for lots of different things so i think they're providing the base uh, infrastructure for it and then they're expecting other people to start building on top of it much like they've done with their their sort of old school bridging and um, then they had their their any any call messaging that they've introduced recently. This is sort of like the next iteration on top of that. So you, you know, more efficient messaging, more um, you can trust the messages more. Um, and then if they actually have it at running efficiently, then it becomes really scalable, and you can do this between lots of chains and start doing all sorts of cool stuff. So what what made Juan wake up and feel dangerous that morning? Like what? Why did he? <laughs> what, what made him get out of bed and say, "Listen"? Phantom is going to build the most scalable vertical uh, vertical scaling L1 in the industry. The FEM is going to come out. We're going to have 4,000 transactions per second finalized, not transactions per second, but finalized. Uh, and all of the liquidity is going to take note of that from Ethereum, and it's all going to bridge over from these uh, ZK proofs uh, from the new multi-chain bridge. And we're going to, and so effectively, the L2 narrative is not going to matter because you're going to be able to get things from Ethereum to Phantom. Is that like, is that, is that what went on? I'm just trying to like, I'm trying to piece this together. I mean, I think I'm sure I, I have, didn't talk to Juan about it, obviously, but um, you know, I'm sure that he's, he's doing marketing and taking sort of a marketing approach and, and 
you know, using this to engage other chains and, and, you know, get people talking about it, which we're now doing. So it's obviously working. Um, yeah. I don't, I, I, you know, I don't, I'm not going to say that he's wrong. I also don't necessarily know that he's right. I don't know that this technology comes out and everyone just moves all their assets to phantom, for example, but it definitely does, um, you know, grease, grease the wheels, so, so to speak, and like make it a little bit easier to bridge, um, makes it a little bit more secure, gives you fewer things to worry about. Phantom has, you know, sort of shifting topics slightly, but there, there have actually been a surprising, maybe not surprising, but a lot of uh, things in the news lately about other chains that end up being relevant to, um, to Phantom, you know, talking about Polygon's reorgs and, um, you know, bridging oh, assets and, uh, you know, finalization, which I guess plays into the Polygon stuff, but just, you know, all the different um, sort of discussions that are, that keep coming up. People, um, uh, you know, want in particular, but a lot of people keep pointing out that Phantom does have, you know, things that, that, that do address a lot of this. I still think, you know, I deep down, I'm a fan of, of vertical scaling. I think it provides a better user experience. And I think, like I said before, it really just comes down to how well they can um, execute. And, you know, I, I do think that at some point, there's probably going to be some amount of horizontal scaling that happens on Phantom, but, you know, I think that they don't see any reason to talk about it for now because there's still a lot of upside um, with what they're doing now and stuff like ZK router makes it easier for people to get to phantom. So, you know, presumably that does bring more liquidity to phantom. Okay. Here, here. Well, I think the so, argument, Oh, sorry. So I think no, no. the argument against phantom before was that you have to use a bridge, right? And bridges, the way they work right now is, you know, you, you put your money on, you know, if you're on Ethereum, you put your money into a smart contract on Ethereum and then some centralized entity has to say, okay, I see that there's money here and I will now issue coins on Phantom, right? And there, there's some person, there's some entity in the middle. That's not like a smart contract between the chains. That's like a, right. a centralized thing. The ZK the ZK router opens that up. So we, we are now having chains actually talk directly to each other. There are multiple points that are verifying this. And uh, and so we, we no longer have to rely on that centralized entity, which dramatically changes the equation for Phantom, at least in Juan's mind, right? Whether it does or not is arguable. But in Juan's mind, it does. He's like, we are exactly as reliable and as good as any of these layer two solutions now. We're in the, we're in the same category. Yeah, and yeah, I, I mean, most, of the of most of the bridges are, uh, are running centralized. I, I did want to point out that multi-chains bridge is decent the old version of it is decentralized they use multi-party computing to verify the transaction but that's where they're gaining efficiencies with zk proofs because now you don't need multiple computers to to agree on this and so like sort of the way that at least multi-chain work before is is you would you'd put this money into an asset or, or uh you know whatever it is tokens into a contract and then many different computers witness that and say oh yeah i saw it go into that that contract and i have this transaction i verify the funds are really there and it's been long enough that they can't reorg did you all see this transaction too and everybody agrees and then they all get together to make uh you know a deposit on the new chain or, or allow the person to withdraw tokens on the other chain but it's it's less efficient because of that decentralization that they've um, implemented which you know uh, as with a lot of things there's pros and cons to it so i think obviously you want it to be decentralized the downside is that you lose efficiencies that's true with blockchains too um but with zk and that's why zk is, is such a hot topic in crypto is because you get away from needing to have this large consensus with lots of computers and um you know you just gain efficiencies if you if you have a single one doing it in to your point i think you know, I'm a little hesitant to say this because it is new technology and, you know, who knows, but part of the idea with ZK in general is that it is a more secure technology. It's more privacy uh, protecting, which actually that's another thing to point out also, because it is zero knowledge. You don't necessarily have the visibility to bridge transactions that you would today. So there is more privacy in, involved in uh, messaging and bridging between chains. Um, it is going to I, I suspect that your your point was largely correct, Mark, that you know, with multi-chain doing this, it if you know, assuming it all works out, you're probably gonna see a lot of other bridges start moving to something like this because it's just a better implementation. And then the ones that are more centralized are probably gonna start going away from well, I guess it is still it's centralized but trustable because it's you know yeah. fancy math. So um 
I think you will start seeing more people move that direction, you know, assuming this this all, all works out. And based on the test net transaction, it seems like it did work. So I think this is probably the future of of bridging technology, I think. So February 24th, 1, 1 11 p.m. Eastern, the, the hero's arc, the Roosh's return story, the greatest comeback story of all time. He launches solidly ETH. It gets massive amounts of TVL. And then this bridge brings it all over to Phantom when they come and launch on Phantom. And uh, and he becomes the hero of the chain because it brings massive amounts of TVL back to Phantom. So there, Bro, there's a prediction. LSD means liquid staking derivatives, not oh, quit taking made, acid before the show. <laughs> made it in general. Corval, we gotta talk about this. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> Corval, you, you have to know. So I had my 12 year old had two years of obsessive Harry Potter, right? She would wear the cape okay. to school. So Slytherin are like were capes? the kids with the purple hair smoking cigarettes outside the bathroom, okay. right? And the Gryffindors are like the really smart jocks, uh, like okay. the hot chicks and the football players. And the Hufflepuffs are like the teddy bears, right? So they're, uh, they're the ones that like, you know. That's What's so that he was basically saying you're like I'm a teddy bear, like a, a teddy bear. Yeah, I'm a sweetheart. He, he uh, there's worse you. things I've been called. What's a cool. what's a raven <laughs> called, dude? Are oh, they like shit. I killers? forgot. I forgot about them. I don't even know what the hell. They yeah, do. nobody cares about, about Ravenclaw. Them. Hufflepuffs like the burnout house too. That's the other thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. That's thank you. Yeah. That's that's yeah, dude. Totally. <laughs> they burn All right, out. So, <laughs> they're like eight years who, old when they go to. We didn't go on this topic. Out. Did we cover everyone on this topic? Because we're yeah, getting yeah, we're getting yeah. towards we're the good. end of the we're show, good. and I think what I would like to do is Clay. So you got you did a, a spaces with who the hell was on it? Velodrome, Satin, Equal, and and Thena. Yes, that and equal and Athena. Yeah. So Polygon, right. Binance Smart Chain, uh, Optimism, Phantom. Okay. All right. Cool. What what came out of that, man? What what was like what, what did you get out of that? Because I know like these are I don't know, these are hot freaking topics right now. Yeah. I mean, take Satin, for example. Like we've mentioned them a bunch on this show. They had a two hundred thousand dollar soft cap on their IDO, and they're currently sitting at five million dollars got pumped into it so like a 23x overflow so like everyone's getting like one token or something like that but like like what what did you take from this um so i took a couple of things one you know i would i would encourage you to go listen to it because it is really it's really interesting to hear the perspectives across all the different chains so a few things one they actually are all working together in, in some way shape or form like they they are literally helping each other be successful across these different chains uh, I asked them whether they actually thought they could take on Curve and Uniswap. So is there a day when the market comes back and there's enough liquidity in this market to push it to other platforms because the uh, the flywheel of liquidity is so good in the Solidly model? Um, and and you know I will leave it as a cliffhanger as to what they responded with, but uh, you could imagine that that is the end goal, right? So that's that's uh, that was a big takeaway for me is that you know I think that. The day could come that we we I, I would like to personally see that play out right i want to see if someone can challenge curve for stablecoin supremacy um and you know they had a bunch of different opinions on that uh they opened up roadmaps for at least three of the protocols and and many of which are bringing in concentrated liquidity to the solidly model so you know adopting the uniswap v3 concentrated liquidity um so there's you know i think there's there's a lot of innovation still ongoing like we're on like inning two you know, with, with Velodrome, we're on ending two. We're on ending one with almost all the rest. If you go listen to the roadmap stuff, Velodrome named like 10 things that are about to release, literally. Um, and so yeah. there's a lot of new stuff coming. Uh, and there's, you know, I think that this model was exploratory. I mean, like, I think that even Andre probably called it an experiment at the time, which I kind of didn't really like at the time. I'm like, we're, we're dealing with billions of dollars. This can't be an experiment. <laughs> but Nevertheless, uh, it is an experiment. And so they have now like gone back and said, what, you know, Belgium was like, dude, we were just trying to get this thing out when the OP token was also going to launch. We wanted to ride that momentum because the market was so bad, which means we didn't have a ton of time to sit back and go, how are we going to make this thing as good as it could possibly be? And now they have had that time and they're like, they've got a lot of stuff that's coming down the pike. So uh, super interesting takeaways on the roadmap. Um, you know, I think that they they also pointed out like, hey, each of us have like these little differences between one another. And we're interested to see how it goes for Equalizer who, you know, did this with their rebases where we as or whereas we didn't. And so, you know, there's a bunch, I, I thought it was a fascinating thing. Like this is a rare space where you can sit down with four competitors, uh, have an open conversation that was actually very friendly. 
Um, and I thought it was really, really cool. So I don't know if I'm talking too much, but no, no, you did, lot. you did well. You actually, you kind of prompted me to say something that I've been wanting to say, but I think I should address it now because I get tagged in a lot of stuff, like, uh, and especially with this, I got a lot of questions, like, well, why isn't solidly ETH on there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got tagged um, in and, that shit. And I want to share with you guys why solidly ETH hasn't gotten any uh, airtime. Uh, and it's not because, like, I've met Roosh in person. I actually very much like Roosh. Um, I know that their developers are very, very talented. It has nothing to do with that. What it has to do with is that there's a, when I see a project that actively puts other projects down as a way of bringing their own project up, what that signals to me is that there will be equal and opposite pushback in the other direction, and it's going to be a hindrance. And so all of this being a zero sum game, right? Like, you know, we do these because we want to help the projects, not because like there's something in it for us. Um, that would be a, a net negative is the way that it would feel for me uh, to get involved in something like that. And so that if, if Roosh is watching, that's the reason, buddy, that I haven't I haven't done any videos or, or invited you guys on is because of that public facing pushback against other projects. Be friendly, work with them, make friends in the long run. It's probably going to work out a lot better that way. So I just wanted to clear the air. No need to keep tagging us. We're not going to reply. That's the reason. Snip this. Play it over and over again as a reminder. And I think we're going to end the show there. I think we had a really <laughs> good show, guys. Thank you so much for, for joining us. My name's Austin with BlockBytes. With me, as always, Mr. Crypto Clay, Mark Jeffrey, the lovely Hufflepuff, Corval, and Double Sharp. And we're going to get the hell out of here. Dude, Emmett, take us home, brother. Like the video.